The search for new life forms extends to the invisible edge of the universe. It is a quest to solve the greatest mystery of all. Are we alone? Even as scientists listen for signals of intelligence from beyond our galaxy, here on planet Earth, a search of another kind begins. In Northern California, investigators look for evidence of a man-ape that's still unclassified by science. Our quest for strange creatures takes us to the four corners of the globe and finally beyond the limits of the Earth. In the skies above Belgium, a high-speed UFO encounter leads to a stunning announcement. Just how close have we come to extraterrestrial contact? Victims of alleged alien abductions tell us of ordeals that can last for a lifetime. And now, the search for answers begins as Reader's Digest Mysteries of the Unexplained presents Strange Beings and UFOs. This is a man with a mission to prove or disprove the existence of a legendary creature. This is a cast of its gigantic footprint. Jeff Meldrum, a primate anatomist, is one of a handful of investigators around the world studying these extraordinary clues. From these tracks and some 1,500 U.S. sightings comes a profile of what some call a monster and others a missing link. Its height is estimated at between six and eight feet. Its weight between 280 and 700 pounds. The Indians of the Northwest call the creature Sasquatch. We call it Bigfoot. People sometimes ask, could a Bigfoot track simply be a big human foot? And the answer is quite simply no, that uh, there are very significant differences between the two. Uh, for example, the foot is, is basically much flatter than is a human footprint. There's no discernible um, arch as is found in a, in a human footprint. Uh, there are also differences in the way in which the foot moves. In a more ape-like foot, there is greater flexibility through the instep. And I've seen this feature consistently uh, demonstrated in a number of tracks from a number of different and very diverse situations. New tracks have arrived at Meldrum's lab, along with a home video from a fishing guide named Rich Gear. cast that one. And there's another one right there that's been stepped on by a dog. There's another cast right there. We're headed towards the creek at this point. A long time tracker of Bigfoot, Gear had come well prepared. He made casts of the footprints before following them deeper into the woods. Something moved and then I looked. And there was another down log 30, 40 foot away on the side of the hill and, and staring me sort of bent over, kind of like a linebacker in a football, you know, football game. Head kind of hunched back, looking down around the corner at me, um, was this furry creature. According to Gear, the creature then fled into the forest. As it did, it left behind a few strands of body hair. Okay. How wild. This is unreal. 
here sent them along to Meldrum for analysis. Sasquatch hair samples have been found throughout the Northwest. Meldrum will have these examined at the university's lab. Hello, is this Rich Gear? Yes, this is Jeff Meldrum calling. Yes, I received your package. Yes, it Meldrum will uh, soon visit the heart of order. Bigfoot country to uh, meet I Rich Gear as the search for uh, nature's for most standard. elusive creature continues. Fact, uh, a colleague of mine and myself would like to uh, come out then. Many centuries ago, no one doubted the reality of monsters or that a maiden sacrifice might quench their bloody thirst. Much more than creatures of the imagination, they were dragons to be slain. Strangest of all these fierce and fabled beasts was the griffin. With the head of an eagle and the body of a lion with wings, it was a creature that struck terror in the hearts of men. Across the ancient world, people believed griffins were very real man-eating monsters. Researcher Adrian Mayer now believes she knows why. Legends of monsters often arise in fossil-rich areas. Uh, one good example from antiquity is the griffin. The legend began when Greeks made contact with nomads who mined for gold in the vast deserts of the Central Asia. By word of mouth, the myth traveled west along ancient caravan routes. As more and more Greeks began to go east toward China over these caravan routes to trade for gold, they brought back more and more reports. The ancient nomads mined for gold in a region rich with fossil remains of dinosaurs. Centuries later, when fossil hunters journeyed to the Gobi Desert, they recovered 2,000 tons of fossils from one species alone, Protoceratops. It's easy to see how this real dinosaur inspired the fable of the griffin. The large nostril holes in the fossil skull of Protoceratops were assumed to be its eyes. And in the medieval mind, the beak and claws of a dinosaur became the wings and talons of a monster. Finally, a myth that endured for centuries can now be put to rest. The search for Bigfoot continues. Well, I've spoken to uh, Rich Gear, who sent me the videotape and cast and other materials. He's uh, found a camp for us here, right about there. In Orleans, California, Jeff Meldrum is joined by Richard Greenwell of the International Society of Cryptozoology in Tucson, Arizona. As a cryptozoologist, uh, my job is to, well, first evaluate claims, reports of what we call unverified animals and, and see if we can verify them. And of course, right here in California, we look for Bigfoot. I'm hopeful that this is a real biological phenomenon, we could call it. It's going to be uh, pretty significant for zoology as well as anthropology and as well as society, I think. The team's first objective is to follow up on Rich Gear's recent Bigfoot sighting. A seasoned forest guide, Gear, will donate a few days of his time to help them search for new Bigfoot tracks. Rich Gear, how you doing? Been doing a little scouting around here, and um, just not too far over the hill is where the actual Patterson sighting was, and there's a nice little sandbar there, and possibly, you know, we might see some things that might get exciting. Hey, film your camera, Richard? Yeah, what's that? Hey. If these investigators do find Bigfoot, it won't be the first time a myth has inspired the search and discovery of a real creature. 
Here's an, an example of a, of a, a bear paw, uh, probably a black bear, a real big black bear. Uh, and we see the paw mark here, but we haven't seen the bear. And it's kind of the case with, with Bigfoot. You do see the footprints, but you don't see the Sasquatch itself. But we can see real clearly that... When we return to the search for Bigfoot, Meldrum and Greenwell will visit a place where Sasquatch left more than a footprint. The search for real monsters has led explorers to the far corners of the world. In Asia, the dragon is a symbol of creation and destruction. But was it always just a metaphor, a sign? In this century, the word dragon would take on an entirely new dimension. In 1926, a wealthy American adventurer named W. Douglas Burden made a 15,000-mile journey to Indonesia. Burden was lured to a volcanic island called Komodo by native reports of large and ferocious lizards. As Burden pushed into the unexplored jungles, the island of Komodo seemed like a lost world. After several days of exploration, he set up camp on a 2,000-foot plateau. It was there he encountered a monster forgotten by time. These are the world's first images of the Komodo dragon. Burden could scarcely believe his eyes. It is a real dragon, black as dead lava, whose every aspect speaks of infinite existence. Burden's film provided indisputable proof that his Komodo dragons were real. But half a world away, a single still photograph would trigger a monster controversy that continues to this day. In 1934, an English surgeon named Robert Kenneth Wilson stunned the world with a picture taken from the shores of a lake in Scotland. For decades, witnesses here reported a giant beast swimming in the deep waters of Loch Ness. Wilson claimed to have captured an image of the monster in broad daylight. The photograph was a profile of a huge creature that looked like a dinosaur. Nicknamed Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster, provoked claims of fraud by some scientists. It was hailed as a breakthrough by believers. Recently, in a deathbed confession, a man who claimed to be part of the famous sighting insisted the entire episode was an elaborate hoax. He claimed the celebrated image captured not the likeness of a monster, but a small wooden model attached to a toy submarine. Wilson himself never recanted his claim. Many researchers continue to believe that Nessie is real. Today, we'd like to think we have conquered our fear of monsters of the deep. A cruise on the ocean is little more than a summer diversion, a chance to get away from it all. But buried in our primal hearts, the fear of what lies below haunts us still. The ocean's depths are alien territory, a place where nightmares do come true. The farther we fall into the abyss, the darker and the colder the visions. 
logic vanishes and suddenly we spy the faint outline of a monster. I think we need monsters. I think we need scary, uncontrollable creatures in the sea or out of the sea for that matter to give us the proper sense of humility, to demonstrate to us that we're not really in charge of this planet and we can't do whatever it is we want. Richard Ellis is the author of several books on the search for new life forms in the sea, many illustrated with his own paintings. The ocean is the largest single environment on the planet, and the largest part of that single environment is the deep ocean. 90% of that is two miles deep. So, every once in a while, some mysterious creature is found. Most of the time they're small, occasionally they're large, but there could be almost anything down there that we simply haven't seen. Scientists thought the coelacanth had been extinct for 70 million years. Then in 1938, the fish was found. Here was a fossil suddenly brought to life. In 1982, a U.S. naval research sub dove on volcanic vents a mile and a half below the Pacific. They discovered tube-like alien animals who thrive without oxygen or light in temperatures of 500 degrees Fahrenheit. While these new finds intrigue Richard Ellis, the monster that's captured his imagination remains elusive. The giant squid is the most impressive creature on Earth, I think. The largest invertebrate in the world is a creature that gets to be 60 feet long, that has eyes the size of dinner plates, that has a beak, a gigantic beak shaped like that of a parrot. In addition to that, it is a gigantic animal that has never been seen alive by any human being. And that, I think, adds tremendously to its mystery. There is also an element of fear. Giant squid have preyed upon human beings. In 1873, a huge squid attacked three fishermen off the coast of Newfoundland. When the creature lashed out with a tentacle, one of the crewmen managed to hack it off with an ax. The fishermen not only escaped with their lives, they also got away with the squid's tentacle. Absolute proof of the existence of a true monster of the sea. Recently, the dead body of this giant was hauled aboard an Australian fishing boat. If a beast like this attacked the diver, resistance would be futile. This creature's tentacles are nearly 40 feet long. And the largest one ever measured was 57 feet long. It washed up in New Zealand in 1948. So we know they get to be that big. Do they get to be any bigger? Maybe. So far, no one has captured a giant squid alive. But anyone who tries had best be well prepared. Dr. Hanlon studies squid here at the Marine Biological Laboratory on Cape Cod. These squid are only a fraction of the size of their giant cousins, but their stalking techniques are probably the same. So you're a thousand feet down, total darkness. You come into the range, the visual range of a giant squid, what happens? It recognizes you as prey, it detects you, orients towards you, and all of a sudden out shoot these long tentacles. Wow! And it's got you. Slow motion photography can only hint at the horrors awaiting a diver confronted by a giant squid. Marine researchers hope to find and capture a giant squid in the near future. Until then, Richard Ellis will have to paint his monster from the imagination rather than life.
Medford Taylor is a photographer for National Geographic magazine. Ten years ago, he crossed paths with a creature that haunts a world of stone and ice. It was 1985. The first joint Soviet-American mountain climbing expedition was in its second week. Americans and Russians were scaling a series of peaks in the Pamir Mountains of present-day Tajikistan. The story was covered by National Geographic, and Medford Taylor was sent to capture the adventure on film. Up until this point, I was rather cynical about uh, stories that I'd heard of uh, Bigfoot and Nessie and other such uh, monster stories. And after actually experiencing an incident like this, I began to question my own disbelief. It was during a lull uh, between climbs that I hiked out from the camp some two, three kilometers alone to photograph uh, flowers and uh, fauna around the area. And uh, in one of these valleys, uh, late on an afternoon, I, found, I came upon this very large footprint, seemingly by a human uh, of some sort, but not one of any size I'd ever encountered. This is the first time Medford Taylor's photos of the footprint have been revealed to the world. Not only did I photograph the footprint, but as I, the more I looked at this footprint, the more this, I realized that I was seeing something strange, something I'd never seen before. This chill came over me. It was cold. It was always cold in that desolate valley, and, and there was always a slight wind blowing. But even beyond that, I felt this chill. There was obviously some other being around me in this, in, in this place. Taylor is certain he was not hoaxed. He had told no one in the base camp where he intended to hike that fateful day. All I know is that I took the photographs, they're real, and I suppose when people don't understand the reason for something, they walk away from it. And so I suppose for that reason, I put the pictures away in my own file for the last 10 years, and there they've sat. But I still don't have an answer to this. Unexplained footprints and sightings of ape-like creatures are not confined to Asia. Evidence has been found in many North American states and Canadian provinces. The most frequent reports come from British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. I get asked quite often if, if I believe in Sasquatch, in Bigfoot, and my answer is usually, and, and, and has to continue to be for now, is on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I believe in Bigfoot. And on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, I don't. And on Sundays, I rest. God, it's beautiful here. Yeah, but it's basically lush. You know, we pretty hard to find tracks here. Of all the Bigfoot sightings in the Pacific Northwest, none have matched the incident at Bluff Creek, California. In 1967, two men, Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin, were determined to bring back proof once and for all that Sasquatch existed. That October, they mounted an expedition to Bluff Creek, a site where scores of footprints have been reported. As they explored the creek bed for tracks, their horses were suddenly spooked. <laughs> The 
Gimlin stayed behind, but Patterson grabbed his Super 8 camera and raced toward the ape-like form squatting beside the creek. This is the actual scene Patterson shot in 1967. A few seconds of film of what he and Gimlin swore was a living and breathing Sasquatch. Jeff Meldrum believes that if the film is a hoax, it would have required a sophisticated knowledge of primate anatomy, something that Patterson did not possess. Uh, the subject of the Patterson film, for example, walks with a very bent kneed gait. He's walking very flat footed. There's a lot of overlap in support between the two limbs. Another feature that intrigues Meldrum is the way the creature swivels its entire upper body. It's the same way great apes with thick upper necks have to move when looking back in mid-stride. So the fact that, that all of these features act in concert, and, and each time I, I see the film, new things sort of come to the surface, keeps bringing me back to the film to study it more and more. Soon, the team will break off their search for Bigfoot. Meldrum is anxious to return to Idaho to learn the results of the lab tests on the Bigfoot hair samples recovered by Rich Gear. In the meantime, they know that just beyond the firelight, the very creature they seek could be watching them. Far above the realm of Bigfoot, lies another frontier. New life forms beyond imagination await us in the endless space we call the cosmos. When life is found on this infinite carpet of stars, the discovery will dominate the future of our species. Today, public opinion polls indicate more and more people believe in alien encounters. Witnesses on every continent have reported strange objects in the skies, unidentified flying objects that defy conventional explanation. But most scientists maintain that alien civilizations would never consider space travel as a means of contact. This doesn't sound like the kind of thing that a smart alien intelligence would do. Dr. Paul Horowitz is a Harvard physicist the cost of a round trip to the nearest star, using technology we could not conceive of actually building, but which is permitted by the laws of physics, would use 200 million billion dollars worth of fuel, would use the US power consumption for a million years. I think perhaps the most diplomatic thing one can say is the laws of physics do not prohibit space travel, but the laws of economics in some sense really do. But proponents of extraterrestrial contact point to a variety of evidence. Photographs of UFOs have been investigated by a host of researchers. And UFOs have been tracked by radar operators who know the difference between weather phenomena and something solid. Richard Hall is chairman of the Fund for UFO Research, a group composed of PhDs from various scientific fields. The United States does not take UFOs seriously currently. However, there are certain countries like France and China, mainland China, and particularly Belgium that have had many sightings and do take the subject seriously. In 1990, there were a whole series of radar visual sightings over Belgium involving state-of-the-art jet interceptors, multiple radars, None of this could be explained. In 1990, the Belgian Defense Ministry, through radar and visual observation, confirmed an outbreak of UFO sightings. At one point, Air Force fighters were sent to intercept the UFOs, which were simultaneously tracked by airborne and ground radars. The Belgian jets locked onto the objects for five seconds, 
before the UFO sped away at speeds that would have killed a human pilot. It is impossible even with, with a stealth aircraft to accelerate within one second uh, from uh, 150 knots till 500 knots, uh, that is for sure. Because Maybe. even the human body would not uh, tolerate such an acceleration. Thousands of witnesses, including the military and the police, reported sighting the UFOs. Consistent drawings of triangular objects were made by people scattered across the region. When authorities compared the sketches with eyewitness photos, the circle of evidence was complete. During this extraordinary press conference, Air Force Colonel Wilfried de Brouwer confirmed the sightings of unidentified flying objects in Belgian airspace. It was the first time a Western government officially admitted that such an encounter had occurred. While military pilots as well as U.S. and Russian astronauts have reported UFO sightings, many more have been made by civilians who never gave UFOs a second thought. There's a little sloop sailing north on the river. Sam Gerard and his wife Alice live along the Hudson River just north of New York City. Gerard is a retired oceanographer and senior research associate of the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University. Alice is a former school administrator. Yes. Well, I really had, didn't know anything about UFOs before this incident. I thought they were most unlikely, uh, and I didn't really believe uh, in people who said they'd seen them until I saw one myself. As a scientist, uh, I was a complete agnostic. Uh, if I were to see one, I could then believe in it, but uh, just to hear accounts of their existence was not any scientific proof as far as I was concerned. On March 16, 1996, the Girards were driving east on Veterans Memorial Highway. At 5.45 p.m., they saw a low-flying object through the trees. We slowed down enough to determine that it was probably neither a helicopter nor a light plane. Sam and Alice followed the object to Lake Tapan, where it hovered in one position high over the water. Sam made this sketch of a UFO covered with flashing lights. Uh, you could see these lights even though it was a bright sun uh, from the west and back of us. It looked like a piece of junk jewelry because the lights didn't seem to be arranged regularly. They were uh, sort of bright. Uh, they all seemed to me to be like electric light bulbs. That, that were in the article in the paper that we... Sam Girard has designed instruments that were adapted for use during the Apollo project to the moon, but nothing in his experience explains the object he saw that afternoon. I can state unequivocally that uh, this was not a conventional aircraft, nor was it powered by any system that is uh, understood even by people with uh, a high level of understanding of technology. Sam and Alice's encounter is the latest in a series of American sightings that began in a period following the Second World War clustered around a two-week period in the late 1940s, reports came in from all 48 states. The modern UFO era began in 1947 when Kenneth Arnold, a private pilot over Washington State, sighted a chain of objects skimming along over the mountaintops. And he said that they flew like a saucer does when you skip it across water. And that's the origin of the expression flying saucer. And then there was the Roswell incident, the most controversial encounter in the history of the UFO phenomenon. In July of 1947, a local rancher named Mac Brazel discovered fragments of a metallic material spread over a quarter square mile of his land. 
it looked like a crash site. The fragments were turned over to officials at the Roswell Army Airfield, home of the 509th Bomber Group. Roswell is now a civilian airfield, but for Air Corps veteran Walter G. Hart, it seems like only yesterday when he was summoned to the office of his commanding officer. Well, that day of uh, July the 8th, 1947, I was given information by Colonel William H. Blanchard, the commanding officer. Hart, the base's public relations officer, was told by his boss that a UFO had crashed just outside Roswell. And the release that he wanted me to put out and hand deliver to the four local media, in essence, stated that we had in our possession a flying disc. It was being flown to higher headquarters, 8th Air Force in Fort Worth by Major Jesse Marcel, who was our base intelligence officer. While admitting it had recovered a UFO, the military never made mention of any alien bodies. But over the years, several airmen stationed at the base have testified that alien remains were held under tight security in this hangar. A mortician who worked in this Roswell funeral home testified that base personnel inquired about the availability of four child-sized coffins. And a nurse at the base hospital claimed to have witnessed surgeons performing an autopsy on beings that could not have been human. She was transferred overseas and disappeared. Then, just a day after the UFO press release, the same officers from the Roswell base denied that any alien aircraft had been recovered. According to the revised story, the wreckage found by Mac Brazel was from a weather balloon and not a flying saucer. I was told by Colonel Blanchard, who I had all the faith in the world in, that we had in our possession a flying disc, and all of a sudden the general uh, overrides it and says it wasn't. It was a weather balloon. I honestly, in my own mind, couldn't visualize Jesse Marcel, Major Marcel, the intelligence officer, making that big a blooper that he wouldn't know a weather balloon from something else, nor would Colonel Blanchard have not known that it was not a weather balloon. This was quite a, a revelation. Nearly 50 years later, government officials insist no alien bodies were ever found and no wreckage ever recovered from a UFO crash. In 1994, a nonprofit UFO group commissioned a detailed review of the Roswell incident using top secret documents recently released by the U.S. government. It was prepared by Carl Flock, the former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. His report has shocked many who believe in Roswell. The project that I believe was uh, responsible for the debris that uh, was discovered by Rancher Mac Brazel and which led to the announcement of the capture of a flying saucer was, was a project codenamed Mogul. And uh, it was classified top secret, it was very sensitive, it was a very high priority project. It was operated by a team from New York University. Mogul was the code word for an experimental balloon designed to carry equipment high into the atmosphere. Its mission was to detect evidence of Soviet atom bomb tests. According to government records, Mogul balloons were being tested in New Mexico when one of them came down on Mac Brazel's cattle ranch. While Project Mogul explains the strange debris found on a cattle range, there's no explanation for the rumors of alien bodies. 
Carl Flock believes that it's time for the government to acknowledge whether any remains alien or human were ever held in secret at the base. Perhaps then, the Roswell incident can be truly put to rest. While UFO reports continue to come in from all over the world, one UFO phenomenon would confine itself almost entirely to the English countryside. Late in the 1970s, startling evidence of possible alien encounters emerged in the form of strange circular patterns on agricultural land. Every summer, more and more of these mysterious circles appeared on crop fields overnight. Speculation grew that the circles were the result of nocturnal landings by UFOs. Scientists and the media descended on the countryside as the number of crop circles multiplied. There's a flattening. They're actually lying flat on the ground, like this, this one here, and these yeah. along here, look. Yeah. They're flat on the ground while there's others growing up. Like That's again. right. Only in the rain. Yes. Over the years, the crop circles evolved from simple designs to elaborate glyph-like symbols. Some theorized they were extraterrestrial messages. A new branch of UFO study would seek to decipher their meaning. By 1993, the mystery had become a national obsession. But then two men stepped forward and admitted they were the perpetrators of an elaborate joke. Under the cover of darkness, using the simplest of tools, they had stomped their way into history with a spectacular hoax. Uh, I'm Dave Chorley, this is Doug Barr, and we are the two people that have created the crop circles in 1978 through to today. We uh, started doing the patterns, and uh, last year we did the first pictogram at the bottom of Cheese for Head, and that caused quite a sensation. And uh, since then, uh, the Führer's got more and more and more people from overseas coming over because it's uh, something that's even away from the circles, it's more and more important, you see. And uh, they're just uh, scratching their heads. They're still scratching their heads 13 years later. The incident provided the world with some comic relief. But other alleged UFO encounters are more serious and as yet unexplained. These are sketches of alien abductors made by their victims. Most report being confronted by UFOs emanating bright and paralyzing lights. Others claim to have been abducted from their cars and homes. When they return, they're unable to account for their whereabouts for hours or even days. Abductees say they're often restrained and subjected to painful physical tests, invasive procedures focused on sexual organs. Some people who claim to have been abducted exhibit round depressions called scoop marks, as if a layer of cells had been surgically removed from their bodies. Others suffer long cuts and straight line gashes. Bud Hopkins has written two books on abductions and has interviewed hundreds of abductees. You get very, very few hoaxes because a person is calling you saying, uh, I don't know what happened to me, I might be losing my mind, I don't want you to call back to my house because I don't want my wife to know that I've talked to you, I don't know what's happening, etc. Uh, and they insist on anonymity and so forth. There's hardly a, uh, the motivation for a hoaxer in that. There's no way that you cover yourself with glory. 
Oh, I never uh, thought about UFOs. Um, it never really occurred to me at all about even their, their possibility until I was 17 and it was in my face and there was no way to avoid it. Chris Hinton is a 42-year-old assistant building contractor in Washington, D.C. He provided this interview in hopes of helping other victims. Over the course of a week in the summer of 1972, Chris was helping his brother prepare for a driving test. Each night, they saw several UFOs in the sky. We see a bright light over the horizon just shoot across the sky, lightning speed, and then stop suddenly on a dime. This voice explains, as this light projects off the side of the ship, we're hypnotizing you. And there's no need to be afraid, you just relax. And we are gonna communicate telepathically. Chris's teenage encounters triggered forgotten memories replays of other alien abductions that stretched back into his childhood years. When I was four years old, I had been lost in the woods for several hours. And two figures about my size came up, one on either side of me from behind. And they said, well, you come with us, Chris. All I saw was a ramp, it looked like a metallic ramp that entered a doorway and they put me on this table and they clamped my skull into like a vice of some sort. I remember I just couldn't move and I saw this contraption, it was metallic and they clamped it firm. I could not move. And they rammed something up the back of my head and it hurt like the devil, I was screaming. And they packed me up and walked me out of the, out of the ship. And I'm running back home. By 1992, stories like Chris's had become so widespread that a special conference was convened at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to investigate alien abductions. Sponsored by the Fund for UFO Research, it was attended by prominent scientists, abduction victims, and UFO researchers. Studies have been conducted that show that abductees who don't know anything about the UFO subject they don't know what other people have reported, still will come out with the identical story in exactly the same sequence. But scientists at the conference wanted hard proof. We hear tales of people being abducted. We hear heartfelt stories. Uh, these people are clearly affected by what they've imagined or seen or something. But we never get a real piece of evidence. Bud Hopkins believes he's found the kind of evidence scientists are looking for here in Salt Lake City, Utah. This woman and her son had an abduction experience. To protect their privacy, they requested we mask their identities. Their ordeal began on a drive home from a family get-together. And all of a sudden, we were hit by that bright light, just a bright light. that came from nowhere. Uh, I couldn't see the road, I knew I was moving. I looked over at him and I told him, I can't see the road. And that's the last of my memory. My recollection is my mother let go of the steering wheel and at that point I reached over and grabbed it. I can't remember going home, I can't remember the next day. Like many abductees, memories of intrusive alien surgery began to haunt Joan. A year later, an accident would reveal some extraordinary evidence. I hit my head on the fireplace, and I was out unconscious for about 45 minutes. I woke up and made it to the phone and called my parents, and they came and took me to the hospital. And they x-rayed my head. I 
from that. Suspecting, I suppose, a skull fracture, yeah. right? Yeah, there was no skull fracture. It was fine. But the doctor came running, running through ER yelling, how did you get this metal in your head? Well, I had no idea, neither did my parents. I've never had a head injury to where I could get metal in my brain. The radiologist's report indicates an oval metallic object of unknown origin is lodged in the parasagittal region of the woman's brain. The official hospital report goes on to state, the appearance is unusual for an artifact, and certainly the pattern would be worthy of pursuit. Skeptics insist that reports of alien abductions are the product of some mass subconscious hysteria. But if they are fantasies, how do we explain the radiologist report? UFO researchers do share some common ground with the academic establishment. Just north of Boston, Massachusetts, the Billion Channel Extraterrestrial Assay, or BETA project, is an ambitious scientific search for extraterrestrial intelligence. A joint project of Harvard University and the Planetary Society of Pasadena, California, this radio telescope is listening for a signal from outer space. Nearly all objects in space generate various kinds of random radio waves. These waves are monitored by beta on 250 million channels and translated into red and green spikes. If alien cultures are trying to communicate to other civilizations, a strong radio beacon would be a logical way to say hello. Should Beta spot an unusually strong and steady signal, its powerful computer would peg it as an alien radio beacon. Dr. Paul Horowitz of Harvard University directs the project. Life elsewhere in the universe, guaranteed. Life elsewhere in our galaxy of 400 billion stars, guaranteed. Intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, guaranteed. Intelligent life elsewhere in our galaxy, so overwhelmingly likely that I'd give you any odds you like. I think the tough part is, is the intelligent life interested in communicating? Are they sending messages by method that we can detect in our direction at a power level sufficient for us to detect? Jeff Meldrum has returned from Bigfoot country to his lab in Idaho. He's back just in time. Preliminary tests on the Bigfoot hair sample have been completed with significant results. The hair strands from Northern California are strikingly similar to alleged Sasquatch samples from other states. DNA studies will soon compare the hair with samples taken from gorillas. If, in fact, the, the DNA compares most closely to the living great apes, then it's, it's strong evidence that, uh, that Bigfoot is, in fact, part of a, a very early ape lineage that uh, gave rise to the modern living apes, such as chimps and gorillas. The initial results of the DNA tests did confirm the hair samples from Northern California are of animal, not human origin and are not of any species known to exist in North America. Some believe we will never find Bigfoot because it doesn't exist. They tell us there are no more mysterious creatures to be found on Earth. And yet, we keep finding them. In 1994, a new species of animal is captured in Vietnam, called the Saula. It's the largest new mammal to have been discovered in the past 50 years. That same year, another deer-like creature, the giant Muntjac, is found in nearby Laos. 
In Antarctica, scientists uncover a meteor from Mars. In 1996, they announced that evidence of alien life forms is embedded in its surface. Based on these spectacular revelations, who can predict what unexplained mysteries await us still? Are we alone? No, not by any means. Will there be other encounters? The answer is yes. It's only a matter of time and space.